invitados. So Amanda said I could talk for like four hours. <laughs> so settle in. <laughs> Bathrooms around the corner. Thank you to the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters and the Mead Public Library for inviting me. This is a real treat. Um, I'm in a beautiful town, and you have this lake over here. <laughs> over here. Yeah. It goes from over here to over there. <laughs> when some people go, I know. I'm right. uh, I'll be speaking for a while about how I became, to, became a poet, and then uh, I'll talk about suggestions for writing poetry, if you're, whether or not you're interested in that or not. And uh, then I'll just read some poems, and then around 8 o'clock, I hope, um, we'll have some questions and answers. At least questions. <laughs> uh, I was, I've been trying to memorize poems. I think for some reason it, it's important. Catherine Gofell from Appleton, uh, one of my poet sisters, says you need to know three poems and two good jokes in case you're ever stuck in an elevator. <laughs> yeah, and so I think it's pretty good advice. So I, I'm just trying to memorize Thomas Moore. He's an Irish poet. And he wrote this poem uh, in 1805. And it was, it's called The Last Rose of Summer. And it's kind of a dreary thing, but I kind of like <laughs> dreary things. And I, I'm trying to memorize it, and I notice there's this pattern, you know, rhyme and number of syllables and everything. And all of a sudden, how many watch Disneyland on Wednesday nights way back when? Disney? Disney show? Okay. Well, they used to have records that you could buy. And on the record, there was a, a tune called Sweet Betsy from Pike. And all of a sudden, I realized that the words fit perfectly with that song. So it helped me to memorize. So uh, let's see if I can do it. Um, last Rose of Summer. Tis the last rose of summer left blooming alone. All her lovely companions are faded and gone. No flower of her kindred, no rosebud is nigh to reflect back her blushes or give sigh for sigh. I'll not leave thee thou lone one to pine on the stem, since the lovelies art sleeping, go sleep thou with them. And here's a gesture. Thus kindly I scatter <laughs> thy leaves o'er the bed, where thy mates of the garden lie scentless and dead. So soon may I follow when friendships decay. And from love's shining circle, the gems drop away. When true hearts lie withered, and fair ones are flown, oh, who would inhabit this bleak world alone? Oh, who would inhabit this bleak world alone? So. Also, and, uh, writers and artists and poets make connections. They see something, and they, then they, they go through their brain, and they go through the culture, and they start connections. And all, I also realized that that poem fits in uh, the, the song, Twas the Night Before Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house. Except it didn't work exactly, but you know how your mind works like that? And the other day, I was uh, listening, uh, probably everybody knows, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, Robert Frost. The MASH theme? <laughs> Suicide is painless? Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, so my little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse. Me. I don't know why I tell people that, but it's that's my kind.
kind of fun. I think uh, people, some people in Asia make fun of Westerners uh, because they can't uh, entertain themselves in an empty room. And I've never had a problem <laughs> entertaining myself in an empty room. Anyway, also, poetry and music, there, there's a marriage between them. They cannot be broken. And then when we first started out with poetry, they were songs. Let's say the warrior woman from Sheboygan finally beat those beats from Manitowoc. And people would sing the epic story. Uh, and it, it, if, they, if it rhymed, it was easier to transfer. And these are people who maybe couldn't read and write. But it's always been important, always been important. And my mother loved music, and I think I got most of my love of words and talent, if I have any, from her. My dad was a grocer, wasn't really interested in music and, and stuff like that. But um, I remember she was one of my major influences. She, um, she was from Oklahoma. I grew up in Kansas City. She was from Oklahoma, and she talked like this. And we were Baptist, B-A-B-D-I-S-T, Baptist. And um, she's not very educated, but read all the time, and loved to read, and loved to sing. And she would come across the word, <clears throat> and if she didn't know it, she would sound it out. You know how like you talk the sound out? Of, and she'd come up, let's say the word was renewable, OK? Renewable. And she didn't know what the word was, so she would sound it out, and it would be reenie wa And she, she would write a song about reenie And she would sing the reenie wobble song in the kitchen, and then take, grab me when I went by, and we would dance to the reenie wobble song, or whatever it was. And I remember that. It was so delightful. And I didn't know that there were some families that didn't do that. <laughs> Especially the Lutherans. <laughs> you know, they're kind of our own. Just, they don't do that. Yes, they do. They break out in song. You know. So I think that I, I really thanks Mom. Thanks. It was, it was a wonderful thing. In fact, I'll read um, a poem that I wrote kind of about that. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit and then maybe read a poem. Yeah. You guys going anywhere? Uh, is it Melissa Etheridge concert? Yeah. Uh, it's over there. Yeah. Start at 7.30, so if you really want to. Oh, that way? I get turned around with no windows. I get turned around sometimes. Anyway, this is called Footlights. And uh, for you youngsters in the audience, I use a a phrase that, it's called house stress. You may not know what that is. A house stress. What, what is a house stress? People, women, used to wear them uh, and make them and use them to call patterns and build a house dress. Footlights. My mother danced to Charleston in her house dress at the kitchen sink. She sang out, take it easy, breezy, up to heaven. She raised her arms to shake her hands and howled the hokey pokey of the solar wind, swayed this way and that way in her blue moon flowered house dress. Ooh, the shuffle ball change of the cosmic soft shoe. She smiled at me at universe downstage and pointed her open palm as if to say, take it, baby, easy now, breezy. I remember my mom. You don't have to clap after everything, just slows me down. Um, okay. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, um, no one else was in the house, so I went in the attic. You ever do that? And look, look, look at stuff. And I opened a couple of boxes, and there was a a black box, like a black lacquer box. And I opened it up, and there was this beautiful gold embossed orange tome, big book. And it turned out that it was uh, uh, translations from the Chinese by Arthur Whaley. And I don't know where we got that book. 
It just appeared. So I started reading it. And I read Lee Poe. And I read these poets from the 1200s, from the 1100s. And here's Lee Poe. He's drunk, sitting by the river, singing to the moon. And I thought, Not the drunk part necessarily, but I can see why people, and it was, he just came alive for me for some reason. And so I started writing poetry, and I wrote the world's worst poetry. Um, the keep in the tree for you and me, da 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 he he he. Awesome, awesome. And, um, but I kept writing it. But I, I wrote it in secret because my dad wanted me to play baseball. And it just, I, I, I told him at one point I wanted to be an artist. And he said, it's from Missouri, okay? Art don't plant no corn. <laughs> and I understood real quick what he meant. But uh, I got through high school. And when I went to college, I started reading, God help me, um, Rod McJune, <laughs> Listen to the Warm. And I swear that Rod McJune wrote that book just for me. <laughs> I didn't know how sappy it was until years later. But I go, wow, this guy really gets it, you know? And I, I started looking around at, at other poetry, and I discovered E.E. E. Cummings. And E.E. E. Cummings gave me permission, not only not to use punctuation anymore, but to play with words. The goat-footed little boy goes far and we um, and the words were somehow to be played with. And I think that's what poets do, too. So uh, I'll read that. It's, it's a poem called, um, no, wrong book. It's called Shebang. How do you pronounce it? Shebang? Shebang? The whole enchilada, right? And I remember I was at the WFOP meeting, Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets, up in Door County somewhere, and we had just eaten lunch, and another 200 people were going to be reading their poems. And, uh, <laughs> and I was digesting. And I looked out, and it was one of the first nice days of, of spring. And it was absolutely beautiful, and I felt that I was in the right place. That, have you ever feel that this is it? This is really where I belong? I wrote this, Shivan. These people, these place, these time of day, these breeze, oh, ain't they sweet? These air to breathe, these sun wet world, these whole big blue green deal. And then these nights, these children moon, these stars on string, these stars, these twang of things. He wang. It didn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's playful. I think I, you can get this. Then I met, I met, I discovered March Piercy, who was a uh, very tough, very tough Detroit housewife. And she pulled no punches in her books. And I didn't know that you could really just smack somebody upside the head with some of her poetry. Uh, she's still one of my favorite poets. And then Leonard Cohen. Somebody gave me, I was on a bus going from La Crosse to Kansas City, and a guy got on, on the bus and he had, um, he picked him up and he, not at a, just by the side of the road, he got on the bus, and he had a, a, a fly fishing rod and the book of Leonard Cohen poems. <laughs> and he sat by me, and for the next three hours, he read, Leonard Cohen belongs to me. And then I said, that's wonderful. And he said, well, keep the book. Keep the book. Never saw him again. And uh, it just, Leonard Cohen stepped into my life. Also, Richard Brodigan. Richard Brodigan had some issues. Well, he, he, he ended up killing himself. He, he drank himself to death and shot himself, but wherever. But he wrote a poem, and this is it. It's called, We Stopped at Perfect Days. We stopped at perfect days and got out of the car. 
I just love that. <laughs> we stopped at Perfect Days and got out of the car. The wind glanced at her hair. It was as simple as that. I turned to say something. In the poem. <laughs> I turned to say something. And he just broke so many rules there that it gave me permission to. Then I went through my Salvador Dali period. But nobody understood any word, anything I said. So <laughs> Serena Hart was oh, these are melting clocks. How cool. It was like album covers, you know, it was really cool. Eh, not that cool. But I did have some wonderful teachers. One was John Judson uh, from uh, University of Cross and a great, great teacher. And um, I, I studied for a walk, just one summer, a couple weeks with Thomas Lux, who died about a month ago now, Thomas Lux. And he, uh, he was an amazing teacher. And I just agreed with so much that he had to say about poetry. The other teacher is Mark Doty, and he's gonna be in Milwaukee reading. Where is he teaching now? Houston or Rutgers? Where? Rutgers. Rutgers. Oh, in Newark. Yeah. Oh, in oh, Okay. But he was he's amazing. He just uh, if you want to go to a really good poetry reading, <laughs> go see Mark. Um, I get my inspiration from mostly three things. I call them the three R's because I'm an old guy, and this is the way I can remember them <laughs> from reading. If I read a good poem, I, I read it and enjoy it, and then I read it again and again to see how they did that to me, how they do that. And the other one is regarding, just sitting at the bus station and watching people come and go, just watching. And the other one is remembering. I like to write uh, poems about when I was a kid. And so I, I'll, I'll read this, um, this is about regarding. I was commissioned to write a poem. Has, has anybody ever been commissioned to write a poem? It's not the way I work. Uh, I sit on the poet's couch with a little net and get them when they come by. <laughs> uh, but you need to write a poem about John Muir's early childhood. Because in Marquette County, where I live, on, on County F, we have a park, John Muir Park. And this is where he actually lived for 10 years. And uh, this lake. Uh, Ennis Lake was where he was, and uh, so the national people from the park system came and dedicated the, it was great, it was wonderful. So, I wrote this, called The Song of Ennis Lake, The Boyhood Home of John Muir. Rise up early, walk the path around the lake, plant one foot and then the other, quiet yourself, listen to the song, the silence, the morning shush of the white pine needles, the red-winged blackbird announces whose cattail is whose, the drumming stomp of the grouse on the hollow log, the fog burns off, the dragonfly flutters, the honeybees sizzle on the wild purple bergamot, the hummingbirds buzz, the yellow foxglove, the sun sparkles on the water, then silence. Your foot snaps a twig, a raft of mallards quack, a squawk of sandhill cranes, goose heads bob up and down, the bear claws sharpen on the hickory, the antlers scrape the oak, the muskrat dives beneath the bank, the beaver drags a sapling in its wake, the swoop and splash of the eagle, the swoosh of the kingfisher, the tapping stops, the woodpecker bounces in its flight. Bluegills pop at water bugs in the shallows. As the sun slides west around the sky, the shadows swirl and change. The sun declines to red and gold. The shadows grow. At moonrise, the northern pipe skirts through the minnows. The black bass boils the lily pad. The white-footed mouse looks this way and that. The little brown bat picks off mosquitoes. The crickets tell the temperature is falling. The bullfrog tunes the timpani. Then darkness. The nighthawk wheezes overhead. The coyotes yip and whine around the fresh kill. 
The great horned owl swivels its head and stares. The endless rise and fall of the whippoorwill. Heat lightning bursts behind a cloud. Distant thunder rolls. The light rain on the marsh marigolds. You walk. You know how to slow yourself. Let go. Slow down to hear the song exactly as it's sung. The melody and harmony, the tempo and the tone. This song is never sung the same way twice. You remember now. The world is best taken in at walking speed. It's in the silence you learn the song, and you learn the song by heart. And uh, was that just once around the lake? No, that was 40 years of walking around lakes. And uh, uh, if I have advice for an emerging poet, um, other than you'll never be famous, it's, um, oh, you might, you know, you never know. Pay attention. Pay attention, that's your job. They say that nothing's lost on the poet. Nothing is ever lost. It's a group of stuff. So I joined the WFOP, and uh, I met some people, and WFOP, if, if you're interested, WFOP, uh, www.wfop.org, if you want to look it up. Is that right? Correct? Yeah. Um, four or five hundred poets in Wisconsin, they, you'll love them. They are supportive. They take you where you are and help you. And they're just a wonderful organization. Um, and I think artists need to get together with other artists. I think that's just really very important. Because believe it or not, there are some people who aren't necessarily artists, and they don't get it. But, um, no and then uh, in the last few years, I've been working in the prisons. And um, very rewarding. I go into three state prisons and do writing prompts for poetry with the prisoners. And the poetry just pours out of me. Uh, it's just like it's right below the skin, and it just comes out. And I think it's because they don't have a voice. And somebody said, thanks for coming. It's great that you give a voice to the voiceless. First couple of times um, I went, I thought, Oh, they really like me. You know, this is really great. I'm going to keep doing this. And then I understood they would like a one armed accordion player. I mean, just anything to break up the, you know, get so. And all of a sudden I realized it's not about me at all. But it gives them a chance to hear the other prisoners and they clap and holler at each other. And you know, it's just really a wonderful thing. Consider being a volunteer in, in the prison. They need you. But I also wrote a couple of poems about that experience, and this is called Time In, Time Out. You walk in and show your ID. You sign the book Time In, 5.37 p.m. You pick up your badge, drop your quarter, and pull your wallet, put your wallet in, your watch, your keys, and phone in the locker. You place your notebook and pencils, your belt and shoes and coat in the x-ray tub, walk through the metal detector, reclaim your belt and shoes and coat, your notebook and your pen, they stamp the back of your hand, you wait till the door buzzes and clicks open, you walk, you wait till the first gate buzzes and clicks, you walk, you wait till the second gate buzzes and clicks, you walk 50 yards under the umbrella of razor wire, past the towers, the shadows, to enter the classroom block. You stop and hold your hand under the black light. You go in and sit down and wait for the dozen men in forest green to, to arrive. You give the first writing prompt, my gift. You wait 10 minutes and one man comes to the microphone, my gift, he says, and wipes his face and reads, the wife called yesterday. She said our baby walked. My baby said, I walk, Daddy, I walk. That's good, baby, that's real good, he pauses. This was my gift, he says, and sits down. And when class was over, I said goodbye to the men who lived there and walked through the first gate, 
walked through the second gate, the door, I heard the buzzers and the metal clicking tight, held my hands under the black line, took my badge off, crossed my name off, time out, 8.17 p.m., got my things from the locker, put the quarter back in my pocket, and walked out. I put my coat on, and I walked out. Okay. Um, these are writing suggestions for emerging poem, poets, poems. Be a better poem. <laughs> um, how many of you write? Some did use them one, maybe would, could. Okay. I think it's important. Uh, where, okay. Uh, I'm just, these are suggestions, and they're only suggestions. They kind of what worked for me and some other people, but you go ahead and if you're going to write the greatest poem in the world, just go pay no attention to me and go do it. When you get your inspiration, um, get it all down right away. Just don't think about it. Just put it all down. No editing. Then you start to think, are any patterns emerging? Any rhymes? Internal rhymes? End rhymes? Mark Doty says that if you know exactly what's going to go into the poem, don't write the poem. And I was it Frost who said, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. And I would suggest that here you have, this is what poems look like before they get started. And, uh, okay, all of a sudden, uh, uh, the raccoon is a little smuggler. I don't know. You know, okay, that's all I'm going to then you decide if that's the title, or the middle, or the end, and you start to build the poem up and down. And start to see if there's a pattern. Maybe it's starting to rhyme, then you might want to actually choose formal rhymes. Marilyn Taylor, who is a poet laureate, I can't say it, I mean, how does it go? Poet laureate? Yeah. Um, she, she writes formal poetry, and she loves to be in that cage and come up with the perfect word, and I don't have the patience, I get a little claustrophobic, but I also think that the difference between novels and um, short stories and po poems, uh, imagine a winter, a novel is like the whole Wisconsin winter, you know, comes and goes and here and all these characters. A short story is just like one little weekend, on Friday here comes a storm, storm comes, it goes away, okay. But a poem is, is a snowball, just a snowball. And it's packed, it's packed. And it's only meant to do like one thing, just be direct or, or capture a moment. And I don't think it's anything more, more than that. Making connections. You start to write and then somebody said, sit there with soft eyes and don't really concentrate on anything and let everything go through you and tone down. And you'll start to see, string theory is a mathematical thing, string theory. But anyway, I have another theory that everything is connected with strings. You just can't see them. And, but you can, if you figure out that there is a connection of string, the artist can kind of pluck that string and make music. Is that too weird? Um, part of the job is to find the connection. Pay attention. So your job is, as a poet is to paint with words. And to use all the senses you can. Um, it works out better for the reader. Um, also, amateur poets, when they start out, they don't use um, concrete images. And you really want to use concrete images. So I would say, don't don't use the word bird. Use the word. Somebody say something. Purple macaw. Now that I know, I never pulled that one out. <laughs> but if you're going to paint the picture for the reader, you don't say tree. You say hope, maple, shrub. You know. Paint the picture better. And it's your job to, they'll never know you, you 
change the parts. You know, you can do that. Or not necessarily, you don't say little girl, you say Emily or whatever, and, and really paint the picture. And then sometimes amateur uh, poets um, write about, and a lot of the poems that used to be in the New Yorker, uh, they don't have images. They don't do anything emotionally towards me, and I always thought that I had failed the poems in the New Yorker. But you got to give me somewhere to stand. As a reader, tell me, at least by the third or fourth line, that this is going to be a poem about rat terriers. Okay, you know, how many channels do you have at home? You know, 150? Get me on a channel. Okay, we're going to beg something right now. Okay, whatever. Also, check the verbs. The verbs, I think, are the most important scaffolding structure in the poems. Uh, here's a real quick exercise. Um, you know what a verb is? Okay. I hope so. Um, the boy went down the street. Okay? What's the verb? Went. Is there a, a different verb that you could insert to paint a more specific picture? Yeah. He stepped down the street. He ran, he ran down the street. He skipped. He skipped. He He uh, yeah. If you can spell it, yeah. sashay. Um, dribble the ball. Yeah. Dribble the ball. Yeah. See, every time the picture changes just like that. And now thinking outside of the box, the boy clouded down the street. He Tuesday down the street, and everybody just howled. I go, what's so funny about that? He says, that's the day you get out. <laughs> Tuesday is always the day that you get to go. Okay? And so when this guy Tuesday down the street, everybody got that just perfectly. And that's how, that, that's how you can do it. That's the, that's the thing. Um, sometimes, oh, Thomas Luck says there are on-ramps. The idea that got you into the poem Sometimes you can get rid of them after the after the end, end of the poem because you might start repeating yourself. He also says be direct. He also says eschew equivocation. <laughs> eschew, gesundheit. Um, eschew. What does that mean? Eschew. Huh? Avoid equivocation. Don't like sort of. I well kind of. We used to call it pussyfooting. Is that still a word you can use? Okay. <laughs> but call it what it is. Say they did that. Not he sort of. Okay. Right. Oh, he also says avoid cliches like the plague. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way I can remember that. <laughs> um, oh, the rule of threes. It's not a rule, okay. But you know what alliteration is? Love like a lady, she's losing a day, da da Okay, or assonance is uh, the sound of the vowels that repeat over and over again. Don't do it more than three times <laughs> because the brain of the people, for the people, of the people, by the people, for the people, is a beautiful on the ear. But of the people, by the people, for the people, in case the people do da 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 people, their brains start to go, I see what you're trying to do to me. And they get distracted really quick. But the, love, the, ear, uh, the ear loves three things in a row for some reason. And then um, repeating, repeating. In church, you, you, you sing the verse, and then you sing the chorus. And you sing the, another verse, and the chorus can take on a different meaning at that point. And this is what the Greeks found, okay? But it was Greek, so I don't know. What it but um, the Greek chorus used to repeat things. And my brother's favorite joke, well, it's called repetendre by the French. And my brother's favorite joke is, you know those old French have a word for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and repetendre just simply means just repeat it. And miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before 
right sleep. It's just a simple device that really nailed it. Don't tell the reader everything. They are not stupid. Um, you like to read mysteries sometimes? They don't tell you who did it on the first page. You wouldn't read the book. They want to play along. If you're an artist and you want to draw a circle, you don't have to draw the whole circle. Am I preaching here? Okay. You don't have to draw the whole circle. You just draw about three quarters of it, and people will fill it in. I mean, it's just that's what they do. And readers love to discover on their own. So give them some wiggle room. <laughs> uh, line length. I think lines should be about um, oh, a one breath long. I start to panic when I get too far away from the margin. And so, you know, like, if you're reading a poem and if it doesn't have punctuation or whatever, you read about a breath's worth of words, and it just seems to be more human. The breathing, the heartbeats, all, all of that. Remember Ronald Reagan? Some of us loved him. Ronald Reagan was an excellent. I mean, he brought thousands of people to tears, one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it. <clears throat> but he, when he was a kid, he, in high school, he took rhetoric. And uh, your grandma probably took rhetoric in high school. And remember, rhetoric is uh, a, write about something or prove a point. So he used these devices. And you talk about logos. Pathos and ethos, and there, those aren't the three musketeers, those are your words. Um, but close. And logos means knowledge. If you're going to write something, have some knowledge. And people love to learn stuff from books, uh, from poems, and everything. And pathos, you have to show that you're sympathetic or have some kind of feeling to e evoke a feeling in somebody, in someone. And then ethos. Is sometimes called to a higher, higher point. Like you probably have the most beautiful sunsets in the world in Shibuya, and you write this poem about how beautiful the sunset is in Shibuya, or maybe I should say dawn because because it comes over the water. Right. Okay, got the most beautiful sunrises in the world. So right. Well, you have the most beautiful sun. I cry every time I see the most beautiful sunrise in the world. And my question for you is, so what? You know what I mean? You gotta give me a little. If it's beautiful, fine, it's beautiful. What you wrote, but sometimes you you evoke a higher purpose. So Ronald Reagan would talk about homeless people, and he said, "Well, we got four million homeless people, and now we got to take care of them." Okay. Uh, here's one of them now. And he was showing you a homeless person or somebody. <laughs> and they did me this horrible. And um, I feel sorry for these people. And then he would say, as a country, we expect more from you, and we need to do something about that. So in, just in those few words, he would use all of those rhetorical devices. And it, it really was, uh, it really helped, I thought. People ask me about titles. I, I won't go on and on. Okay, titles. Yes, I think you should have them. Okay? And it shouldn't be a title like abstract number 249. I mean, if you really want to, okay, you all go home and write the abstract 249. But as an old guy, I need to find these poems someday. So I actually, the one about raccoons has the word raccoon in it. So I can look under R and actually find the poem again. And it's, uh, but there's all kinds of things you can do with uh, titles you can turn and twist. Cleverness. It's like cuteness in junior high for a boy. It only goes so far. You know? If you want to be clever, go be clever. But it gets old. There is some um, I am not a Native American, but if I write a poem about Native American something somewhere. I don't have to be a Native American, but I have to sound like I am. It has to ring true. And if it doesn't ring true, then it's, it's, it's an awful kind of thing. Spell check is your friend. Okay. Um, it, 
it doesn't do everything, right? But poets have to be so careful, because even one letter can change the whole. Here's a poem I wrote. It's called Getting Even. One letter wrong can change the entire picture. And getting each letter in just the right order can be as hard and sweaty work as prying old broads off your porch for six hours on an August afternoon. <laughs> there are only two mistakes in that. <laughs> but it somehow changes the meaning. <laughs> you have to be careful. Be careful with your words. Um, and the sound. The sound's inside the words that the, the poet uses the words. And do you remember the movie Psycho? Yeah. The shower scene? Yeah. What was the sound in the background? Eek, eek, eek. It's a terrible sound. So you probably wouldn't want to put that in the lullaby that you, that, you know? And you can actually choose. And I swear, it's the, the sounds in the words the poet chooses that that make the difference between um, taping the poem together and nailing it. It, really, it. it can really show craft when it sets that kind of tone. Uh, I'll read this. Uh, this is a poem I wrote for my son. Um, when he was young, he, he wouldn't be able to sleep because we're going to go to the park tomorrow or whatever. And he couldn't sleep. So I... Um, well, I'll just read it. Milk from Sleepy Cows. For Willie. Here, my son, today is done. The cows have all come home. Drink this milk fresh, warm, and silk. It's milk from sleepy cows. Drowsy cows now close their eyes to dream the orange sundown. Night night cows, cream black and white, come round from blue green hillside. Warm and dreamy, smooth and creamy, milk from sleepy cows. Rest well yourself. The world will somehow swirl without you for a while. Sleep now. Beep now. Not a peep now. Shush boy. Hush. A lot of ease in that. So they're guidelines. They're not laws. Okay. But that seemed a little bit. And I really enjoyed writing that. Just from the sound. I guess it's okay to like stuffy, you're right, <laughs> and stuffy paint. Okay, I'm going to read, um, read some things. I went to um, public school in Kansas City. I was all excited about it. I had an older brother <clears throat> who loved school. And I, this is Wizard of Oz country, Kansas City. And I got the worst teacher in the whole world for kindergarten. It's called Apple. In public school, my kindergarten teacher, Miss Smoots, was colorless and starched, always dressed in black and white, not quite as beautiful as Margaret Hamilton in the opening segment of The Wizard of Oz the clothes. I believe she was made of naga hide. I'm sorry, she'd say to a child acting up. I thought I was the teacher here, but you must be the real teacher, and teachers must have a classroom, muffins pay. I wonder where we might find one, leading the pupil by the neck. Oh, here's one now. Then Miss Smoots would tie my classmate up face down around the base of the toilet in the bathroom, by the wrists with a towel or two. If you cry, she pointed out, you'll go to the principal's office. And you don't even want to dream what goes on in the principal's office now, do you? One afternoon during recess, I stood fascinated watching the second grade girls do skin the cats. You know what skin the cats are? You know what skin the cats are? Somebody tell me. Skin the cat on the bars, you know, they, you, they flip over and then they flip back. What do you call them? I'm from Missouri. You don't have a word for that. <laughs> I, I could show you. Well, they were doing 
in the cab. I got to change the whole poem. <laughs> Watching the second grade girls do skin the caps, they hang from the bars, throw their thin legs up between their arms, and land somehow on their feet on the other side of themselves. Upside down and almost inside out, their flowered skirts draped over their faces. They looked like they were made of rubber bands. And after a count or two, they'd flip back and resume being second grade girls again. I could watch them forever. But in a moment, I was torn from the scene, pulled by my ear, and marched back to the classroom. I know what you were looking at, said Miss Smokes. Sit here and put your head down on the table for the rest of the day. Think hard about what you did. Think hard. And she stormed off, muttering something about pink bare legs and white panties. Pink bare legs and white panties. I never told my folks. The next day, I think I remember staring at the empty bars at recess and watching an apple with a bite out of it roll down the asphalt past me from the jungle gym. As it bounced by in a blur, I saw the hazy pink and white of it tumbling over and over. There were many complaints about Miss Smoots, and I heard she'd been called to the principal's office. But I'm not sure what happened there. And I remember that soon, however, Girls were no longer allowed to do skin the cats like in Wisconsin. <laughs> Miss Smoots must have been a real teacher. I learned so much from her. Now every time I watch The Wizard of Oz and I don't have to think hard about this, my favorite part is when right before those colors bloom, the house comes down with that thud. <laughs> That's how I started my education. <laughs> and then in first grade I had Mrs. Miller, who was my grandmother and your grandmother and every sweet grandmother in the whole world. And you could sit in your lap and learn how to read. And uh, it was okay. It was okay after that. So I guess you're going to have a worse teacher at some point in your life, right? Um, in Guatemala, uh, I studied Spanish some, and uh, in the central district, uh, in the middle of the town, uh, the plaza, uh, they would have children, uh, los niños de la calle, the children of the street. And I didn't know how these kids survived, and maybe they didn't. But I, all, I wondered if they had the same dreams that I do. Like this called White Stallions. The children of the street must see themselves in the greasy puddles of the forenoon, in the sundown storefront windows, in the luster of the shoes they shine. Must see themselves in the reflection of a customer's sunglasses, in the tears of the old women, in the shadow of the bus. The children of the street must see themselves flying purple kites on sunny beaches, dining with the family after church, riding white stallions, the children of the street must see themselves. Kansas City, uh, I had two brothers. I was the middle brother. Um, we were Baptists, like I said. And um, they don't give sainthood in baptism. Um, but if they did, my mother would have been saint for raising three boys. I lived on, a, on 55th Street, and when we would screw up being little boys that we were, she would threaten to sell us to the hot dog man. <laughs> and uh, she'll take anything to make his hot dog. And that's all she needed to say, you know? Okay. None of us ever were sold to the hot dog man. The hot dog man. She threatened to sell us to the hot dog man. I had my chance, Mom whispered. The hot dog man takes anything he'd cart you off, no questions asked. In summer, my mother, having had it up to here, again with us three boys, would run away from home. We wouldn't notice for an hour or so until we got hungry or thought, oh no, this time she might be gone for good. She 
She'd walk around the block a time or two. We saw her sitting on the corner curb, her legs stretched out across the sewer grate, holding her face in both her hands to cry. It was embarrassing to have the neighbors see her sitting there. I was the one elected to collect her, say we're sorry, ask forgiveness, tell her whatever it took, whatever we did, we wouldn't do again, promise. I take her hand and bring her home. One of us would hug her, one would clean his room. I do the dishes. For the rest of the day, we put away our wooden swords, our wounding words. We gave her peace, we gave her quiet. And when tomorrow came and we resumed the awful evil that boys do, I'd look around from time to time to make sure she remained. We boys are grown. Our mother's gone for good. Yet no one knows what really goes inside those hot dogs. So I look out for the man who asks no questions. I listen for that jangle of his cart. Um, went to school in La Crosse and worked at Lutheran Hospital, Gunnison Clinic, in the emergency ward during college. And there was a, what do you call it, urban, um, urban story, what's the Urban legend. Yeah, urban legend. And uh, I mean, it might have been true. It's called In the Living Room. In the living room the following day, the authorities asked how it was. She'd come to sleep with her dead husband for three nights running. Couldn't tell the difference, she said. <laughs> yeah, they asked, but what about the smell? Well, like I just said. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Read this one. Read, uh, a couple more and then we'll have some questions. Be thinking about the questions you may have. Uh, Baptist, uh, um, I screwed up when I was like in third grade in uh, Sunday school. I screwed up so bad that the superintendent of Sunday school asked to meet with my parents at our house. It's called Cross-Eyed. Superintendent Sutherland demanded to meet with my family Wednesday night after supper. He smiled briefly at my parents and focused squarely on me. And what exactly were you thinking? Don't you realize you've sinned against the Trinity Baptist Church and the entire Eastman Kodak Company? Why, for the love of God, did you want to make baby Jesus cry? <laughs> That's a pretty big gun, right? Oh, I digress. <clears throat> I had to admit it was a split-second decision on my part just as the superintendent was about to snap our third grade Sunday school class graduation picture to grin and cross my eyes. <laughs> my parents were struck dumb when he produced the photograph in evidence. Your son has managed single-handedly to ruin our 1956 church family album. <laughs> Tears welled in my mother's eyes as she stared at the portrait of her white shirt and bow tie boy surrounded by girls in Easter pastel pinafores. Mom started to speak, but broke out in a laugh, grabbed her stomach, rocking back and forth, trying clearly not to split a gut. My dad glanced at the photo and guffawed. That's hilarious, he said, and slapped my knee. <laughs> Superintendent Sutherland stood up when the laughter died down. I took a breath and apologized. I never intended to make baby Jesus cry, I said. My mother rose and suppressed another chuckle as she showed him the door saying, I'm so sorry, it won't happen again. Good night. He left. She shut the front door and turned to face me winked and pulled her dentures out, tugged her ears up, and crossed her eyes. <laughs> She's a good mom. You like her. You like her a lot. You like her a lot. 
sometimes and stumble in the stars that sparkle always blinds us we trip up tumble down we suffocate in stardust drown in floodlight and still we recreate we sing we write we dance we paint we one more time in space ourselves remake return retune gracefully we rise again we're artists Grateful for another dreadful chance to chase the moon. Thank you very much. 